In this lecture, we're going to look more closely at the acceleration of a parametric curve. Let's start with some examples. So here we have r1 of t is the familiar parametrization of the unit circle, cosine of t, sine of t, for t values going from 0 to 2 pi. We know that that circle looks like this. It goes around once in a counterclockwise direction. The velocity vector is negative sine of t, cosine of t. That's a unit length velocity vector, so the speed is a constant 1. This is a unit speed parametrization. The acceleration vector is negative cosine of t, negative sine of t. If I sketch that vector at this point here, we would sketch that vector as going from this point back to the origin. So that's the acceleration vector for some time value getting close to 2 pi. In this parametrization, the velocity vector is actually the unit tangent vector, and the acceleration vector is actually the unit normal vector. But that is special for this parametrization. So let's look at a different description of the same curve. Here, r2 of t is cosine of t squared, sine of t squared for t values going from 0 to square root of 2 pi. It's going to trace out the same curve. But we will get different results for the velocity, speed, and acceleration. So let me compute those. Using the chain rule and factoring out what they have in common, we can write the velocity vector as 2t times negative sine of t squared cosine of t squared, which means that the speed is 2t. This parametrization actually starts with a speed of 0, which we typically don't allow, but it's okay because it's right at the starting point, and then after that, the velocity vector is never 0. If we compute the acceleration vector, we would get this. It's a bigger vector, sorry, I had to write it small. But using the product rule, we take derivative of the scalar out front, we get 2 times the vector negative sine t squared cosine t squared, and then fix the scalar out front and differentiate the vector components, factoring out the minus 2t that they would have in common, and we're left with the first vector minus 4t squared cosine t squared sine t squared. So the velocity and acceleration vectors here are going to look different than they did for the curve on the left. Let me give you a demonstration now of what they would look like. So here is this curve being traced out for t values from 0 to square root of 2 pi. I've plotted the unit tangent and unit normal vectors. They live exactly where you would expect. So they're both unit length vectors. t is pointing us in the direction of motion, and n is pointing us directly into the bend. Unlike for our first parametrization, the acceleration vector here does not point directly along n. So here you can see how it's situated relative to t and n. OK, let's look at these two examples. Here we have a parametric curve r3 of t is t 2t for t values going from 0 to 4. If you look at the components of this vector value function, notice x is t and y is 2t. So in other words, x is half y or if you prefer, y is 2x. So this parametric curve is sweeping out a line segment that lives on the line y equals 2x, starting from an x value of 0 and going to an x value of 4. The velocity vector is a constant 1, 2, which means that the speed is a constant square root of 5. Because the velocity vector is completely constant, its magnitude is constant, and its sense of direction is constant, the acceleration vector is indeed zero. Now the curve on the right is sweeping out the exact same part of the line segment y equals 2x. In this case though, the velocity vector is 2t, 4t, which you could write as 2t times the vector 1, 2. So the speed is 2t, square root of 5. In this case, the acceleration is not zero because here our sense of direction is always the same but the speed is not the same. So the acceleration vector is the vector 2, 4. So 2, 4 notice is parallel to the line. As we travel from the origin out to the point 4, 8, both the velocity and acceleration vectors are pointing us forwards. For the rest of this lecture, what we're going to do is take the acceleration vector and break it down in terms of the vectors t, n, and b, although we'll see that b doesn't really come into it at all. 
Basically, we want to relate the acceleration vector to those Frenet frame components. So given that we have this natural frame based on the geometry of the curve, where does the acceleration vector live relative to those components? To get the acceleration vector, we differentiate the velocity vector. But before we do that, let me take the velocity vector and rewrite it as the product of its magnitude and its sense of direction. So the magnitude of the velocity vector is, of course, the length of the velocity vector. And then its unit length sense of direction is t hat. But I would like to now differentiate this product, and I don't really want to differentiate what looks like a magnitude. However, we have another way of, of thinking of the length of the velocity vector. That's the speed, and the speed for us is the derivative of the arc length function. So I can write r prime is s prime times t hat. That's an expression that's a little bit more natural to differentiate. So now the acceleration vector is the derivative of this product. According to the product rule, that's going to be s prime prime times t hat plus s prime times t hat prime. Previously, we saw that t hat prime could be written as s prime times the curvature times n hat. So let's make that replacement. Now I'm just going to multiply s prime times s prime in the second component. And I'm going to rewrite all of this suppressing the dependence on t just so that we really see what quantities we're looking at here. So everything I'm about to write down is a function of t. So on the right hand side, we're going to have s prime prime times t hat plus the speed squared times the curvature times n hat. And again, these are all functions of t. The big conclusion here is that the acceleration vector can be broken down into a vector sum, a vector sum of a scaled version of t plus a scaled version of n. OK, let's look a little bit more at this vector sum. What this combination of t and n is telling me is that the acceleration vector must live in the osculating plane. That's the plane containing both t and n. In other words, it's the plane whose orthogonal vector is b. In fact, we can immediately conclude that the dot product of the acceleration vector and the binormal vector is 0, since we could write it as s double prime times t dot b plus the speed squared times the curvature times n dot b. So since b is perpendicular to the osculating plane, let me sketch part of a space curve. And we're going to sketch it as living in the screen, living in the plane that looks like the screen. The binormal vector will, would either be pointing directly out of the screen towards you or away from you. OK, so let's say this is our curve. Suppose we're traveling left to right, which means at this moment, the unit tangent vector would look like this, and the unit normal vector would look like this. We know the acceleration vector is also going to live in this plane. It's not going to be pointing at all out of the screen or into the screen. It has to live in the same plane as the unit tangent and normal vectors. But we can be a little bit more precise than that. If I look at the coefficients in front of t and n, we can give a better sense of direction. s double prime could be anything. But what we could say is that this is the rate of change of the speed. So if our speed is increasing, then it should be positive. If our speed is staying the same, it should be 0. And if our speed is decreasing, it should be negative. For the other coefficient, we have a square times the curvature. The curvature is never negative. It's a vector magnitude divided by another vector magnitude. So that's a non-negative quantity. And a perfect square is never negative either. So their product is always greater than or equal to 0. What this fact tells us is that when we do the vector sum up here, we do not contribute ever a negative scaled version of the normal vector. So our first component can be anything. It can be pointing in the same direction as the tangent vector, or it could be pointing against it in the negative direction. However, when we add that second component, we are only going to be adding either 0 or a positive scaling of n. So the acceleration vector doesn't just live in the osculating plane. It really lives in like half of the osculating plane.
So since the speed squared times the curvature is greater than or equal to zero, we have to be also pointing into the bend with the acceleration vector. So you could have an acceleration vector that's pointing in this direction. This would be a vector sum that has a positive coefficient for t and a positive coefficient for n, or you could be pointing sort of behind n. That would be s double prime negative, but a positive component of n. Or your acceleration vector could be zero, or it could be pointing parallel to t, forwards or backwards or parallel to n, anything like that, but it can't be pointing out this way. So the angle it forms with the normal vector can't be more than 90 degrees. Let's look at an example. Here's the graph of an ellipse. And what we're going to imagine is that this ellipse is actually the motion of a planet orbiting around a star. If you've ever studied Kepler's laws of planetary motion, you would know that planets like ours orbit around suns in an elliptical fashion. So while the Earth's orbit is almost a perfect circle, in general, a planet's motion around a sun is an ellipse, and the sun exerting a gravitational pull on the planet is located at one of the foci. So here I've taken a much more exaggerated orbit than the one that we're currently following around the sun. So this planet is going to orbit around its star where the star is very clearly located at a focus for an ellipse and not like right at the center of a circle. So we're going to watch this planet orbit around a sun. I'll put on here the unit tangent and normal vectors. Those are always going to point exactly as you would expect. So the unit tangent vector points us forwards. The unit normal vector points into the bend. I'm also going to plot on here the acceleration vector relative to this planet's motion. So there are a couple things to notice with the acceleration vector. It always lives in this plane, the same plane as t and n. It's always pointing kind of into the orbit. Sometimes it points forwards relative to n. Sometimes it's exactly parallel to n. Sometimes it's a little backwards compared to n, but it's never pointing in the opposite direction outside of the ellipse. It's always pointing into half of the osculating plane. A couple other observations to make. When we're closer to the star, the acceleration is greater. So the magnitude of r double prime is longer. When we're farther from the star, the acceleration is smaller. So you'll see the magnitude of the vector decreases. And then because the force being exerted on this planet is coming from the star, the acceleration vector is always pointing right at the star. When we're speeding up, the acceleration vector is pointing more forwards. It has a positive s double prime, so we're pointing more along the same direction as t. When we're slowing down, moving away from the star, the acceleration vector is pointing kind of backwards relative to t, so it'll be behind the n vector. Then right when we kind of turn around, the acceleration vector is parallel to n, and then it starts to get longer because we're accelerating towards the star. But the key thing to notice here is how r double prime is situated relative to t and n. It's always pointing inwards because it can never have a negative normal component of acceleration. When we're speeding up, it's pointing us more forwards. When we're slowing down, it's pointing us backwards. So whether or not it's in front of n or behind n is related to the change in speed. Those coefficients we just identified are called the components of acceleration. So first, the tangential component is the coefficient in front of the t vector, that's s double prime. Whereas the normal component is the coefficient in front of the normal vector, that's the speed squared times the curvature. Let's go through a couple special cases. So what if we're looking at a constant speed parametrization? If the speed is constant, that means that s prime, which is the speed, is just equal to some constant number. So the tangential component of acceleration, s double prime, would have to be zero. So that tells me that the acceleration vector, r double prime of t, 
would be zero plus the square of the speed times the curvature times the normal vector. In other words, the acceleration vector would be parallel to n and pointing in the same direction. An example of that was the first example we saw, just the standard parametrization of the unit circle. What if the curvature is a constant zero? Our curve doesn't bend at all like the straight line examples that we saw. That means that the normal component of acceleration is zero, so the acceleration would just be s double prime times t. If the speed is also constant, that would be zero. That was the first parametrization of the straight line that we saw. If the speed is not constant, then it's going to be a vector that points either with t or against t, depending on whether or not the parametrization is speeding up or slowing down. That was the second parametrization for the straight line that we saw. And lastly, when would it be the case that a curve always had the acceleration vector parallel to the normal vector? Going back to the first question, it works both ways. If the acceleration vector is parallel to the normal vector, then that means that s double prime must be zero, so the speed is constant.